Section 21 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. The Relations of Geology to Physiography in Our Educational System by T. C. Chamberlain There was a time when it was necessary to search for the material of instruction, but that time has passed. Research has not only supplied a sufficiency of intellectual matter, but has overwhelmed us with a plethora of knowledge. There is much, infinitely much, yet to learn, but more is in hand than can be taught. The day of selection has come. It falls to us now, as educators, to look over our several fields and choose that which is most serviceable for general educational purposes, setting aside the remainder for specialists. This is not less true of the field of geography and geology than of the fields of other sciences. The primary question is, what shall be the criteria of our selection? Granting that all knowledge and all culture are good, the question that presses for solution is, what is best? Best on the whole? Best for the average student? Best at the several stages of study? It will be but repeating an ancient and much worn maxim to say that the selection should have high regard for disciplinary culture. It does not follow, however, that disciplinary culture is not compatible with other desirable characteristics, and that these should not determine the selection. An intellectual wrestling with an economic problem or a struggle to gain knowledge inherently valuable may be as disciplinary as though the problem or the knowledge were valueless in itself. The quest is rather to find that which shall possess value in itself when attained together with disciplinary value in its attainment. It is not one merit alone that should be sought, but a combination of the greatest possible merits. The selection should, therefore, have high regard to the value of the knowledge involved. The selection should embrace a due measure of phenomena with which the student may come into direct contact. The more immediately he deals with the phenomena themselves, the more clear and definite will be his basal concepts, and the more solid and tangible his fundamental ideas. The basal factors of thought in any department should be vivid, and in the study of earth forms and earth structure, this vividness may be best derived by work on the part with which the students are in immediate contact. The selection should be such as to call forth not simply observation and acquisition through memory, but the higher mental processes, analysis, induction, imagination, interpretation, and so forth. The selection will fall short of the highest merit if it does not invite and promote a constant inquiry into the causes that lie back of the phenomena, the history through which they have passed, their significance, and the extension and application of the results of the study to remote phenomena and to broader fields. The selection should embrace matter that has inherent and stimulating significance, that will lead students to read similar significances in like phenomena whenever and wherever presented. The value of the selection will be enhanced if it has immediate and evident relationship to human affairs. However beautiful the purely idealistic conception of mental activity and mental acquisition for its own sake may be, the fact remains that we are human beings and more easily and effectively interested in human affairs than in that which is remote from man's interests. If the selection shall have an evident relationship to economical and industrial interests, its effectiveness will be promoted but if it does not also bear upon man's sociological, intellectual, aesthetical, and ethical interests, it will fall short of the full measure of merit. 
it should make its contribution to these not only by helpful knowledge, but by the culture that accompanies its acquisition, by the suggestiveness of its laws, its modes of action, and its analogies. In addition to these qualities, which may be common to other subjects, the selection in each field should be so made as to open to the student a special realm of culture, and to familiarize him with some great factor of thought not equally well developed by any other subject of study. Each great field may be assumed to possess a richness of its own and to be competent to yield a fruitage which has its own peculiar and incomparable qualities. Now, the study of the earth may assume the phase which we term geography, or the phase which we term geology, or the intermediate phase which we are coming to designate physiography. Each of these has its peculiar place and merits. Each makes contributions to the other, and each imposes the duty of selection within its own field. But besides this, there are questions of the interrelationship between these. It falls to me to discuss the relations of geology to physiography in general education. It may be assumed that the natural order of succession of the phases of earth study in our educational system is, first, geography, then physiography, and lastly, geology. A practical question of importance presents itself on the threshold. How far will the best selection and adaptation of subject matter take material from the field of geology and use it in the field of physiography? How far, on the other hand, should physiography relinquish its field to be cultivated in the name of geology? Or, since the field is a common one in a large degree with no sharp dividing lines, what shall we select as the chief subject matter of instruction and training in physiography? The great features of the earth are at once geographic, physiographic, and geologic. We may shift our somewhat arbitrary lines of distinction very much as we see fit. We may choose that which is educationally best with little regard to these. From the geologic standpoint, the physical study of the earth divides its attention between three great elements. First, the agencies and processes engaged in the sculpturing of the land and their results. Second, the agencies and processes concerned in the deposit of the waste of the land in the seas and other basins and in the building up of strata. And third, the internal agencies and processes which disturb and distort the surface and modify the preceding activities and their results. Now, if we are to study processes and agencies in the geologic phase, we must make selection from these three great fields, and our study should embrace agencies and processes if it is to meet the criteria of merit already sketched. To some extent, we may make selection from all these fields, and within limits this is eminently desirable to give balance, scope, and completeness to the general conception. But an equable distribution will prevent thoroughness of study in any one field. Besides, they possess unequal merits as educational factors. There is, furthermore, a natural order of succession that cannot wisely be ignored. That should be selected which comes first to hand in natural order and is least dependent on other factors. It is obvious that the study of the internal forces presents the most obscure and difficult of the three fields. These forces were very influential in determining the grosser outlines of the Earth's physiognomy, but they were only indirectly involved in developing the finer tracings of the Earth's features, the lineaments of which furnish the best subjects of detailed study in the earlier courses. When the selection is limited to a choice between the sculpturing of the land and the deposition of the seas, the application of the criteria above indicated seems at once decisive. We may be said to be everywhere in contact with the land and in the presence of land sculpturing. We are only here and there in contact with the seas 
or other depositional basins, and the processes of strata building and land growth are not everywhere subservient to direct study. We may be said to be constantly dealing with the results of the disintegration, wear, and wastage of the land. We are only here and there immediately concerned in the depositions of the seas or of like agencies. The natural sequence of processes brings the land action first to our study. The material must be loosened and borne down to the basins before it can be deposited. Derivation goes before deposition. The surface shaping processes are simple in part and complex in part. They present a gradation from simplicity to complexity and from ease to difficulty that makes them happily subservient to the skillful teacher in leading scholars on step by step from the mastery of one point to another as their capacities develop and their previous successes warrant. The processes of deposition and of land growth are simpler and have narrower limitations and hence afford a less rich and pliable field for disciplinary endeavors. The surface shaping agencies are more intimately associated with human affairs and more determinative of human interests than are the depositional processes. From many points of view, therefore, if not from all, the sculpturing of the land constitutes a more rich, pliable, and inviting field for the earlier educational processes than the depositional work of the basins or the crust-disturbing activities of the more obscure forces within the earth. Obvious as this seems upon mere statement, it is nevertheless true that the sculpturing of the land has been rather the last than the first field systematically and adequately cultivated by geologists, and contributions from it to geography and physiography have been among the tardiest and thus far among the most incomplete. The earlier efforts of geologists were largely bestowed on the old strata that form the outer part of the crust and that were produced by ancient deposition, and to the great wrinklings and reliefs of the surface produced by the earth's internal forces. It is only within recent years, perhaps we may be justified in saying only within the last decade or two, that the detailed processes by which the surface contours, the drainage features, and the ergonomic adaptabilities were wrought out and are being wrought out have received systematic and analytic study at the hands of any considerable body of specialists. It is now, perhaps for the first time in the history of the earth study, possible to teach effectively the processes by which surfaces take on the forms they possess, and to read the history and the significance of the physiognomy of the land. The face of the land has its ages and stages as truly as does the face of man. It has its babyhood, its youth, its maturity, its advancing age, its senility, and its end. Every portion of the earth is in some one of these ages or stages and is passing on to the next succeeding. There may arise intercurrent events which cut off the history of a landscape, as accidents cut off the history of a man. But a new history begins and a new succession of stages is inaugurated. Every part of the surface of the earth is, therefore, full of significance. Every valley, every stream, is young or old and is working out a definite history. Every hill and every mountain is developing toward maturity or decadence. Every part of the earth carries on its face a record of what is being done, of what has been done, and of what is to be done, unless intercurrent events cut off its natural progress. There is, therefore, a physiognomy of the earth as well as a physiognomy of man, full of interest, full of significance, full of bearings upon industry and upon civilization. This new field, though chiefly opened up by the geologists, is ground common to geography, physiography, and geology. As a field of original investigation, it will doubtless remain largely the possession of the geologists until there shall arise a specialized class of physiographers 
who shall assume its particular cultivation. It is yet rich in unsolved problems and invites the advanced student and the young investigator as well as the expert specialist. In our established educational system, there appear to me sufficient grounds in the considerations offered for urging that this phase of activity should constitute the central training ground in physiography, not to the exclusion of the other departments, but as that basal part of the subject on which the early disciplinary endeavor should be chiefly expended, and from which the work of the beginner may proceed to other fields. Respecting the place of physiography, the same considerations seem to assign it an intermediate position between geography, as usually introduced, and geology. Geography may be said to have for its special function the presentation of the features of the earth as they are. Physiography has for a part of its special field the study of the physiognomy of the earth as an exhibition of agencies and processes and as a portrayal of the forces that are making and unmaking the face of the land and influencing its inhabitants. While geology has for its function the revelation of the history and structure of the earth and of the forces that work within as well as without it. These are only the salient features. Each has a wider field when given its full compass. It is the peculiar province of geology to teach us something of the extent and significance of time. No study opens up in like degree the great vista of time and extends and amplifies our conceptions in terms of this fundamental condition of thought. Astronomy performs a like function respecting space. These are the twin expansive studies in terms of time and space. The special function of physiography is to develop our perceptions and conceptions of present surface activities and environment and to give us an intellectual command of the agencies which are constantly engaged in molding its configuration into that wide variety and expressiveness and that diverse utility which gives to its intellectual and physical reactions upon the human race such scope and potency in the development of human civilization. Not the least of my purposes has been to invite attention to the important contributions which recent studies have made to physiographic study and to the important place it is entitled to occupy in our educational system. It is my conviction, as already indicated, that physiography should be given a distinct recognition under this distinctive term and a definite place in our curricula intermediate between geography as usually understood and geology. To avoid possible misunderstanding, permit me to say that I recognize, as already intimated, the breadth of the field appropriate to physiography. It may be made to embrace the entire physical environment of man and so to include large factors of meteorology and astronomy, as well as the distribution and physical relations of plants, animals, the races of man, and the types of civilization. Its realm is broader than that of either geography or geology, and in this breadth and comprehensiveness lies one of its claims to a place in our high school courses. It is because of this very breadth that I urge selection and a sufficient concentration upon the part most available for educational purposes, to furnish typical ideas and basal training. I urge concentration upon the immediate environment of man and upon the processes and activities transpiring in our very presence as a groundwork and point of departure for the broader view of man's physical surroundings. The immediate environment involves an important meteorological factor, but that does not fall within my special theme. When physiography shall be developed effectively along these lines, it may very wisely, I think, replace the formal study of geology in our high schools, except in special cases where there are local or personal reasons for retaining it. For physiography taught in this vital and genetic way contains many of the most essential and fundamental elements of geology. End of section 21. Recording 
Bye, Karen.